Welcome to the first keynote uh, lecture of the Jobs and Term Course of 2021. I'm Kunal Sen, the director of UNU Wider. I'm chairing this keynote session. I'm pleased to introduce the keynote speaker. Danny Roderick is a Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard John Kennedy School of Government. He's currently president of the International Economic Association and co-director of the Economics of Inclusive Prosperity. Danny has made significant contributions to research and economic growth, industrialization, globalization, and political economy. In these areas, he's written papers that have been agenda setting and have shaped the field of economics for many years. In fact, when I think about my list of my favorite papers by Danny, the list is incredibly long. Danny also strongly believes in the role of an economist as a public intellectual, and he's written popular books that are widely read and admired. His recent books are Combating Inequality, Rethinking Government's Role. This was published this year, edited with Olivier Blanchard, and Straight Talk and Trade, Ideas for a Sane World Economy, published in 2017. Danny has an, had an enduring interest for many, many years on what he calls capitalism's good jobs problem. And his keynote today is very much on this issue. And of course, this is a core concern in the Jobs and Development Conference. Danny's keynote lecture is titled Good Jobs and Development Strategy. Before I hand over to Danny, please could I ask the audience to send in the questions by chat and I'll read out your questions when the time, is, uh, when the time comes. Danny will speak for about 40, 45 minutes so we'll have about 15 minutes or so for Q&A. Danny, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Kunal. Um, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a great uh, pleasure to be uh, part of this conference. Um, there, there are so many um, interesting um, and important papers that are being presented at, at this conference. Um, um, that are highly relevant to the issues that 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 I want to to talk about. Um, I assume you can see my uh, my um, my PowerPoint. Um, somebody um, interrupt me if you can't. I'm proceeding on the basis that that you can see it. Um, the, the 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 key issue that I want to uh, um, uh, look at uh, during my presentation is what I think um, of as, as, a, as a, a fundamental change uh, in the pattern of structural transformation um, that uh, low-income countries are facing today. And that I think this is what we need to understand and address. Um, and um, I will spend a little bit of time uh, talking uh, about what I think are might be some of the implications or development strategy of, of these uh, of this change in patterns of structural transformation, but I think we need uh, a lot of work to be to do both on understanding why uh, this is happening as well as 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 drawing out its implications. So, what is this change um, that um, I'm I'm talking about? I think it's 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 best put in the context of um, sort of our our traditional model of development, um, sort of this you know which you know, the, the, this view of um, economies going through these various phases of um, economic growth that's maybe associated most by with, with Kuznets, but it's been ingrained in the way that we think about long-term growth and development, which is that e economies start out with most of um, their labor um, in the countryside, in agriculture, very low productivity, informal um, uh, production methods. And then, that then, then there is a process of industrialization. Um, labor moves uh, to the city, um, to manufacturing, um, and uh, together with that, there is also a, a change, a fundamental change in the mode of, of, of production, which is that a production becomes organized. We move into formality. And formality and organized production is important because that's associated with high productivity. And this process of transforming workers from uh, peasants and, and farmers uh, to production workers in organized factories. Um, there is a significant jump in productivity and uh, eventually the wages and earnings of um, uh, workers um, as well. And that um, at some point, of course, as the second arrow indicates, 
uh, then we have a process of deindustrialization that sets in, and that sort of this tertiary sector services starts to start to take over. But these are um, in the in, you know typically high productivity services, which can employ more skilled, more educated workers. Um, and while there are some issues about sort of productivity losses, if, if, if people have to move into services that are you know sort of low productivity, but you know. Um, uh, you know, this it, it, for the most part, this movement into the tertiary sector doesn't cause fundamental <coughs> issues. Now, uh, what is happening in most uh, developing countries today uh, looks actually quite different from the perspective of this traditional benchmark. Um, that is, um, it's not that there is less movement out of the countryside. It's not that people aren't leaving agriculture. That's by and large still happening. Um, but um, the process of urbanization that's taking place is not uh, accompanied uh, by a significant increase in uh, manufacturing uh, and industrialization. And furthermore, that um, the uh, increase in manufacturing industrialization that often takes place tends to be of a highly informal nature um, with productivity di differentials from the countryside. Uh, that are not nearly as significant as organized factory work. So this is, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the, the two dominant themes here is, is one is, you know, a process that, you know, might be called premature deindustrialization in the sense that, that in middle income countries, for example, that, that um, uh, labor is moving out of uh, formal uh, manufacturing or manufacturing in general into services much sooner and at much lower levels of income compared to earlier industrializers. And secondly, that in the uh, in, in both in the uh, middle income countries, but uh, quite strikingly low in income countries, that there is, um, uh, a, you know, that there is this, uh, informality tends to predominate within manufacturing. So this association between industrialization and manufacturing production and uh, organize formal high productivity activities, that association seems to be broken. Um, so to give uh, some real world uh, examples of this phenomenon, uh, look first at um, uh, you know, sort of the traditional pattern, uh, which might be exemplified by an earlier industrializer, Taiwan, and a, actually a relatively late industrializers, but still in, in many ways uh, um, bears the um, landmark uh, patterns that we associate with the traditional model, Vietnam. Um, in both cases, you see in, in, in the green line, you can see a rapid rise in manufacturing employment. And then if we try to break um, the um, uh, employment uh, in um, uh, between a formal component and an informal component, uh, you can see that it's basically formal employment. There's a rise in formal employment uh, that accompanies uh, this increase in industrialization, this increase in industrial employment. Uh, this chart, by the way, um, like uh, some others that I'll show, come from a, a, a recent working paper with um, 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 uh, uh, some, some uh, co uh, co-authors, um, uh, Mark Mackie McMillan, um, and um, Jinchen um, uh, and Mia Ellis. So uh, this is um, uh, a the same picture and um, what it looks like um, in uh, two African instances of industrialization uh, today. Um, uh, Ethiopia, who which actually has uh, you know sort of. Um, is uh, experience significant industrialization. Tanzania much less so, but the patterns look very, very similar. Um, Ethiopia has actually um, sort of, you know, its 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 share of industrial employment, manufacturing employment, has increased from, you know, something like three percent to nearly ten percent uh, over the next ten fifty over the last ten fifteen years or so. So it, it is actually um, a, a a relatively successful example of industrialization um, in a low income country. Uh, but when we break employment into the formal and informal components, the, the pattern that we see is actually uh, very different uh, from what we just saw in the East Asian cases. Uh, formal employment actually has been essentially stagnant uh, in both of these countries. Um, and uh, what has risen 
uh, when we talk about increased uh, industrialization is informal employment. Uh, so uh, what we see in, in these cases, um, uh, such as um, Ethiopia and Tanzania, is, is not is simply a pattern of dualism. That's not really news. Um, we know that there is a lot of dualism um, and, and, and bifurcation uh, of employment by, by type of establishment and so forth. But what we're seeing is, is an exa exacerbation and increase in dualism, particularly within manufacturing. Um, so that um, we look at, um, if we look at uh, patterns of productivity growth and employment growth uh, by a size of firm, what we find is that large firms actually tend to do pretty good in terms of productivity performance, uh, but uh, they experience very little employment growth. Uh, it is the small firms uh, that absorb um, the employment growth wherever there is um, uh, rapid industrialization, as in the case of Ethiopia. But for the small firms also exhibit very poor productivity performance. So it is not just a case of dualism, it's a case of exacerbating dualism. Now, there are a lot of, of um, conventional uh, hypotheses on, on productive uh, dualism. Uh, in, in, in manufacturing, um, and it's not uh, clear if these traditional, if these conventional stories can account um, for what has been happening. There are obviously a variety of market and government failures that might prevent the expansion of small firms. Um, uh, there might be problems with entry and exit, there might be um, high corruption or poor business environment, uh, sometimes high wage costs are, are, are are, 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 are um, advanced as an example. Uh, but in the specific cases of you know, it, countries like uh, Tanzania and Ethiopia, which um, uh, we've looked at with, with, with my co-authors, it's very difficult to argue that those can account for this problem of exacerbation. Um, sort of in terms of labor costs, payroll shares tend to be actually extremely low. Labor costs are not a large part of total costs. Um, 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 you know, the, the other traditional explanations, such as market failures or, or, or government failures, don't necessarily explain why um, uh, productivity growth would be decent and actually pretty good in the large firms, but it's only the smaller firms that would be affected. Um, one thing that uh, seems to um, be happening, uh, which we draw attention to uh, in these countries, is the that um, production in the um, more productive larger firms uh, is actually very capital intensive um, uh, and most likely skill intensive too by the standards of these countries but we have direct evidence um, across entire firms and establishment only for for capital stock um, is that um, in, in these countries, um, the large establishments, the ones that are productive, also tend to be very, very capital uh, intensive compared um, uh, to these countries' fac overall factor endowments, and in fact, compared uh, to other comparator countries, uh, which um, are much richer, have much more capital, um, and therefore, um, um, uh, uh, you know, we would expect their manufacturing establishment to be more capital intensive, but not so much really um, in countries like Tanzania and Eth Ethiopia. So in this uh, chart, you can see that if you look at the largest firms um, in Ethiopia and Tanzania, that the capital intensity actually, you know, either very close or actually exceeds uh, capital intensity of manufacturing firms. Uh, in, in the Czech Republic, a country that's uh, much more uh, um, industrialized, much, much richer, and obviously has much more capital. Um, so the, without getting into uh, more of the details um, on, on sort of this, uh, some of the key points about capital intensity, or what we might call excessive capital intensity in these countries, can be summarized um, in this form uh, that, um, that, um, that this capital intensity, that this discrepancy between the economy's capital labor endowment and the capital intensity of the product of large firms has actually has grown over time. That is to say, capital labor ratios have increased uh, much more rapidly in, in, in Tanzania and Ethiopia uh, in the manufacturing than the economy as a whole. 
Um, and furthermore, when we look at these capital labor ratios um, in the productive firms by sectors, um, that we don't find that, um, that, for example, sectors like traditional labor intensive textiles or clothing firms are not necessarily more capital labor ratios, more, are not necessarily less capital intensive than manufacturing firms on average. If we look at um, uh, firms that are um, uh, more inclined to export, and therefore you would think that in countries like these might be more labor intensive, more in line with underlying comparative advantage. We don't find that exporting firms are, are um, actually more uh, labor intensive um, than, than the economy on average. So what's what's uh, going on here? I mean, this is a, a you know to to to, to our uh, for us is it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a puzzle, uh, but I think we put what is happening to in terms of um, uh, capital intensity in manufacturing in these very low income countries in the context of a global uh, transformation in technology. Um, uh, then it becomes a little bit easier to understand that essentially globally uh, manufacturing has become over time much more skill intensive and much more uh, capital intensive. And I, I think to some extent what's happening um, in, in, in a way that I'll explain in a second is that um, uh, you know, this pattern is being replicated uh, in the firms that are in the more productive that in some sense are you know, have to become more capital intensive in order to compete um, either in export markets or in their domestic markets from, with imports from other countries. So this just shows you, for example, globally, uh, what is happening in terms of the employment intensity of manufacturing. And if we, if we break employment into three categories of workers, uh, low skill workers, intermediate skill workers, and high skill workers, and this is um, a group of, I think, uh, maybe some 20, 25 um, uh, rich or middle income countries. Uh, what you find is that essentially um, uh, there has been a very rapid drop uh, in the intensity of manufacturing um, uh, in low uh, skill um, workers. And, and, and this is, of course, something we know that has been happening and it's quite dramatic here in terms of how this uh, loss in employment is, is really focused at the low end uh, of, of, of skills. And sort of, you know, we think that is associated with the introduction of much more skill and capital intensive technologies in manufacturing. Um, and, it's, it, and, and it's likely that this pattern is also being reflected. Uh, in employment in technology choices and therefore in employment patterns, even in the low income countries as well, to the extent that um, you know, frontier technology shares common uh, uh, characteristics across countries. So let me just step back here and just think about the implications of this in a kind of very simple partial equilibrium uh, analytical framework. Um, so let's think about the, the kind of choices that firms uh, in a developing country face uh, when the nature of global technology uh, um, uh, changes. So uh, this is a uh, thing about these, this sort of representing firms in developing country uh, for the time being, um, you know, forget the, the dashed line here. And suppose that firms in a developing country have uh, initially access uh, two kinds of technologies. One is a labor intensive technology, so it uses a lot of labor. And the other is the capital intensive uh, technology that uses a lot of capital. Now, given that capital is expensive and uh, labor is cheap uh, in this developing country, you know, it could be that the labor intensive technology, the, the cost curve, the unit cost curve actually lies below that for the capital intensive technology. So um, it's naturally that, that these firms are going to choose the labor intensive technology. And, and so they will produce, if the world price is P0, uh, they'll produce uh, uh, Q0 at that world price P0. So this is the initial equilibrium, if you will, before more capital and skill intensive technologies are introduced globally, okay? So now let's look at what happens when this global technological change happens. Uh, so we have this process of technological innovation, but for simplicity, let's assume that this is essentially what it does is pushes the costs down, unit costs down only for the capital intensive technology. So now the capital intensive technology unit cost curve uh, moves down to the one that's sort of the dashed curve uh, in this in this in this chart. 
So what's that going to, to do? Um, you know, the first, it, it, what it does is because now uh, countries with a lot of capital can produce uh, much more cheaply given this innovation, uh, that essentially this is going to lower uh, the global price of manufacturing. And let's suppose that that reduction in the global price is P1. Uh, so this represents the ability of capital abundance, skill abundant countries uh, to be producing more competitively. Now, you will note that I've, the way I've drawn the downward reduction, the downward shift in the, uh, in the unit cost curve for the capital intensive technology that is faced by firms in a developing country, that the vertical shift is actually less than the vertical shift uh, in uh, prices, in global prices. And that's because capital is more expensive uh, in the developing countries. So they're not going to be advantaged nearly as much by this kind of technological innovation. Further, it, it could be that there are uh, frictions uh, in the transfer of technology so that the actual costs that are being faced uh, by uh, firms in uh, developing countries don't fall nearly as much uh, as the costs are, uh, uh, as the reduction in cost for firms in the capital abundant or the rich countries. So the, the vertical downward shift uh, in the unit cost curve uh, for the capital intensive technology in the rich in the poor countries is actually lower than that in the rich countries. So, um, uh, nevertheless, the way that I've drawn this at price P1, which is the new world price, you can see that the labor intensive technology in the poor country in the LDC is no longer viable. Uh, so what has to happen? Uh, is that uh, firms in the developing countries, if they want to compete globally, they have to shift to the capital intensive technology. So they shift to the capital intensive technology, even though they're sort of somewhat disadvantaged by this change in global uh, technology um, in the sense that um, their competitors are gaining more. So what does that mean in terms of development outcomes and in terms of jobs in manufacturing in particular? Um, so there are essentially a triple whammy here. Um, one is that there is an direct employment loss due to the fact that um, given the lower price P1 um, and uh, that the downward shift uh, in uh, the cap capital intensive technology uh, is, is uh, less than in the advanced countries, there is a direct employment loss to the reduction in output, which is um, uh, um, shown here with a you know, shift from Q0 to Q1. Uh, so this is the, the, the direct effect of a kind of a reduction in comparative advantage. So skill and capital wise technological change essentially reduces comparative advantage that the developing countries have in manufacturing. With regard to employment, there is actually an additional loss uh, because now we've also moved from a capital intensive technique to a labor intensive technique. And therefore there's additional employment loss due to this shift in the type of technology that is being used. So that's the second shock uh, to employment. And third, um, there is a, a kind of um, an effect that comes over time. Um, that is that uh, because the technology that now in place is more capital intensive, then uh, employment in the developing country is going to be less responsive to positive prob prob profitability shocks. So the, this, the cost curve uh, essentially is going to be steeper. Um, that means that if for whatever reason governments do the right thing, the business environment improves, world prices rise, uh, the ability of uh, developing countries to take advantage of this is, is reduced. Um, uh, because um, essentially, you know, uh, capital is relatively scarce and expensive in the developing countries, as are the complements to capital, such as uh, skills and, and public infrastructure and, 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 and all of that. So that's what I, what I would call sort of this kind of a triple whammy on employment. Uh, first, uh, the effect of a, a, a decline in comparative advantage in manufacturing, in, in uh, uh, second, um, an additional loss in employment due to the shift in technology. And third, a kind of um, lack of responsiveness, uh, lack of increase in output and employment uh, in response to um, good policies or positive shocks. 
Um, so that's one way of understanding the effects of global technological change and the bias in new technologies and the direction of capital and, and uh, um, skill intensity and its effect on uh, developing countries and labor markets in developing countries. Um, so uh, the immediate question uh, that this raises is whether um, uh, that's, you know, that's uh, can be offset um, by sort of other sectors, uh, services, or perhaps modern non-traditional agriculture stepping in um, what um, manufacturing traditionally did. So for reasons that, you know, sort of as we saw, manufacturing is the traditional escalator for growth. Um, in order to answer the question whether there are viable alternatives uh, to industrialization driven growth, we need to understand precisely why it is that historically and until very recently industrialization was the driver of rapid growth and rapid convergence. Um, I think there are three background conditions that enabled manufacturing to be a special force for or special escalator for rapid growth. I think they're all equally important. First, it's productivity dynamics. That is that um, the evidence uh, suggests that in fact, there is unconditional labor productivity convergence in manufacturing. Um, so that, you know, put it in, in, in colloquial terms, it's relatively easy to transfer technology from abroad. And, you know, if you have a auto plant and putting, you know, in a kind of, a, um, in a, put it in a developing country setting and productivity convergence tends to be there um, and relatively rapid. And it's unconditional in the sense that you can do that even if the overall policy environment, institutional environment is sort of weak. Um, and, and so that makes um, uh, manufacturing different and special from uh, the rest of the economy. So we know economies as a whole don't exhibit unconditional convergence, but modern formal manufacturing does. Um, the second uh, is that traditionally manufacturing has been able to absorb a lot of unskilled labor from the countryside. Uh, so that, um, uh, you know, that there has not been a constraint on the supply side for the expansion of manufacturing, because you can expand simply by uh, using uh, what eff effectively the economy is most abundant in, which is uh, low skill workers. And third, uh, tradability, which is that there is no constraint on the demand side either, which is that you don't need to wait for productivity in the rest of the economy to rise to create demand. Uh, for manufacturing output that you can simply export. Uh, so in other words, you can expand without uh, running into this problem of relative prices turning against you because the rest of the economy remains poor and therefore demand is low. Um, and of course, what has happened now is sort of everything that I've told is that, you know, you know, items one and three still are there, but what we're missing now, what is gone is uh, two. That is that, especially with respect to formal organized manufacturing with the right kind of productivity dynamics, exhibiting unconditional convergence, uh, we don't have this labor absorption capacity in a way that, that I've already talked about and have illustrated um, with the examples of, of Ethiopia and, 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 and Tanzania. So what that, that means is that you know the, the the alternatives that we might think of uh, sectors that might act as uh, alternative growth uh, escalators don't really quite serve that function because they don't necessarily have uh, exhibit those three features. Um, so uh, in agriculture, um, you know, it's possible that, that there are parts of agriculture that might exhibit significant uh, productivity gains. In fact, a lot of recent gain pre-COVID was driven by increase in productivity in agriculture. And certainly many low-income countries have lots of possibilities for uh, non-traditional export agriculture. The problem here is in terms of, you know, it's very hard for us to imagine scenarios where agriculture as a whole uh, will, uh, you know, increase, uh, you know, absorb increasingly employment. Um, so uh, employment in agriculture as a whole will have to shrink. Um, and so, you know, so agriculture is not a solution uh, in the, in the sense that, uh, you know, the, always, we still have to ask the question, where is, will the labor that agriculture releases uh, go? So it's very difficult to envisage a scenario where, 
um, agriculture becomes bigger and larger part of the labor force. Uh, uh, and, and, and by the way, so most modern uh, agriculture that has very high productivity is not necessarily labor absorbing. Um, so you know, sort of the best, you know, the good soybeans in Latin America or sort of, you know, um, 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 uh, you know, uh, in fed agriculture, and so it, it's not going to be necessarily in, in sort of traditional export in that new export crops. It's not doesn't absorb a lot of labor. It tends to be skill and also capital intensive. Now the services um, essentially are very you know, hodgepodge of very different kinds of activities. Um, now the high product there is a high productivity tradable segment um, such as you know finance, insurance, uh, IT, business services. And a couple of uh, developing countries, India and the Philippines in particular, uh, have done relatively well in those uh, high productivity tradable segments. But because uh, those um, high productivity segments uh, tend to be relatively skill intensive, um, uh, and therefore their skill requirements are so much misaligned with the skill endowments of these countries, there is again a mismatch. And that uh, even in the best, um, most successful cases like India and the Philippines, their ability to absorb a significant uh, segment, significant part of the labor force, uh, which is mostly low skill, um, has, has, has been quite limited. And then the bulk of services are really these low productivity, non-tradable services, uh, and 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 these uh, are you know really cannot act as you know growth poles in the way that manufacturing traditionally did. Uh, because they're they're not tradable, uh, so you need sort of across the board increases in productivity rather than relying on sort of you know individual uh, sectors that can sort of lead growth. Um, so it's a very very different uh, process. So the, the, the so this leaves me uh, and I think leaves us with a kind of a, a, a conundrum um, that I think is, is the key question that faces development strategy is um, where will the good jobs come from? Ironically, it's not that different for, from, from the problem or the key question that many advanced countries face as well, although obviously the starting position, the initial position is very, very different. Uh, so good jobs, I think it's important to emphasize, are, you know, good jobs are productive jobs. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so they'll have to be, uh, they're not necessarily the most productive in the economy, and that's an issue I'll come back to, but they are, you know, good jobs that have, uh, you know, the, you know that uh, people can do uh, with the skills that they have, and that that you know uh, um, exhibit productivity levels that are uh, at least somewhat higher than the average productivity in the economy. Um, and these were traditionally, of course, manufacturing jobs, and the, and the loss of those is really what creates the conundrum. So I think it's hard to avoid the conclusion um, that, uh, for all the reasons I've talked about, that um, there will have to be a much greater role being played in the future um, uh, by services in creating these kinds of good jobs, and that you know so that's really what a lot of our focus uh, will need to be, and that's why I think that there's an interesting convergence that happens between two types of policies that we've traditionally looked at as being distinct. One is sort of policies of producing economic growth, economic opportunity, and the other is really about social policies, social insurance, poverty reduction, social protection. Um, and, and that uh, there's a sense in which, in fact, um, this new policy challenge, this new development challenge is forcing us to think about these two sets of policies increasingly as being one and the same. So, uh, on the one hand, we cannot really have growth uh, without uh, creating productive jobs and expanding the middle class. So you'll need to create demand domestically and you'll need to create good jobs in these services sectors. Um, uh, uh, so because you, you can't rely on sort of individual export champions to drive growth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you cannot really address the fundamental structural factors behind poverty and inequality uh, without uh, essentially creating good productive jobs for the relatively low skilled workers. And so it's, it becomes effectively um, a, you know, sort of um, one and the same. Now, um, good jobs, I think the evidence also points to good jobs cannot be required, cannot be um, uh, created uh, by 
bad informal low productivity firms. So good jobs are going to require good firms. Um, and, and that is also why, um, you know, we need, I think we'll need a kind of a mixture of interventions on both uh, the, the supply and demand side, sides of the late labor market. Um, so on the one hand, on the, uh, on the supply of skills, uh, you know, we need obviously education and training programs are, are going to be important, but they're not going to be enough uh, if there is not enough demand uh, for on the part of firms. Uh, for uh, you know th those people, so you know we need to create good firms at the same time as we're equipping workers for better jobs, and so therefore you know thinking about new types of industrial policy um, are are going to be um, uh, important part of you know both social policy and, and growth policy. So um, you know I may say a little bit more about what those industrial policies might look like, but uh, in view of time, maybe I'll just skip uh, this slide and I might come back to it uh, in, 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 uh, if I have time at the end, but simply place you know the argument that I'm making um, in the context of our traditional uh, social policies and, and growth policies. And, and, and to do that, um, uh, to do that, let me use a, a matrix I've used. Um, so, um, I, this is a, it's a, it's a somewhat different version of the matrix I've used in, in, in uh, on other occasions. Uh, but but think about you know two questions we we might ask about uh, policies. Uh, you know along the um, columns, you know one question is where exactly in the economy at what stage of the economy do we intervene? And you can think about interventions. Uh, you know, and here the three options are pre-production, production, and post-production. Pre-production refers to interventions that will affect uh, that affect the overall background rules of the economy, the endowments that workers have before they come, uh, before they join uh, uh, production and labor markets. The production uh, stage interventions refer to those that actually directly affect the incentives of firms, innovators, investors, entrepreneurs in the types of economic activities they undertake. Uh, and post-production are policies that are going to affect outcomes after production decisions um, have been made. The second question are, is a question about which, seg which segment of the economy we're targeting or we, we actually care about. And we can think about the parts of the economy that are low productivity, the parts of the economy that are middle productivity, and the parts of the economy that are that are high productivity. Okay, uh, so this is all abstract. Uh, but when we think about our traditional poverty reduction and social protection model, essentially the focus tends to be uh, in on the, the the two or three cells that I've identified um, here. So on the one hand, sort of the low productivity pre-production cells. So we you know sort of you know expect governments to. Or, to, to undertake investments to equip uh, uh, workers, households um, with education, training, also health, uh, so that they can be more productive when they join the labor market. Um, uh, but they're also sort of, you know, post-production redistribution uh, through cash transfers, uh, macroeconomic policies to the extent that they generate the conditions for, um, you know, sort of high demand. Uh, safety nets and other social protection often are sort of, you know, there to, to ensure that people don't fall back into poverty after having, um, you know, sort of uh, moved out of it. So perhaps they, they apply to more to the middle safety, but largely, you know, sort of crudely speaking, this is where our focus is in terms of this broad matrix when we're talking about pro poverty reduction and social production strategies. When we talk about our traditional growth um, and industrial and growth policies, we're really focusing mostly on uh, sort of the high productivity uh, segment of the economy. Uh, so we think about, you know, having the right innovation systems, uh, you know, intellectual property right rules, trade agreements, good institutions and so forth um, to ensure, um, uh, you know, sort of productive uh, activities that are going to be, you know, export oriented, will be able to plug into global value chains. We might intervene in the production chain through um, R&D incentives, various kinds of subsidies, and we might have post-production interventions as well through, you know, corporate tax incentives 
although these are going to obviously become harder now with the uh, global agreement on um, global minimum taxes, uh, but you know, that traditionally has been there to attract um, uh, foreign investors and, and um, profitable, uh, high productivity enterprises. Okay. So uh, the, where, I'm, where I am saying um, sort of the you know, development strategy will uh, need to, to move into uh, I think is increasingly a part of this matrix that are, you know, a traditional social protection or growth models have de-emphasized, but are going to become, I think, increasingly important in this era, which if my premise that uh, productive uh, formal sector jobs in manufacturing are going to be very scarce, that we're going to be moving in this middle, in middle cell uh, where uh, there's a lot of sort of, you know, product and productive production stage interventions um, um, that entail promotion of higher quality jobs and services, employer linked training policies, uh, customized business incentives um, uh, that are explicitly targeted to be job creating, even sort of a, a you know, return to the old discussion on appropriate technologies uh, It's a whole big box. I'm not going to say much of it, of it. Uh, but these are really sort of, you know, have the feature that they're directly affecting uh, decisions on production, employment, innovation, investment. Um, and they're targeted, not necessarily the export champions or the most productive segments of the economy, uh, but sort of the segments that are tend to be much more in the middle productivity segment. And they're going to be mostly uh, domestic, um, domestic um, uh, uh, services. Uh, so um, uh, uh, you know, these, the type of industrial policies that I have in mind here that would move be in this middle cell um, are, yeah, I've written about this in a number of different um, uh, places and I don't have really time to go into them in, in detail, uh, but rather than being sort of top down, uh, arm's length, ex ante rules, uh, they tend to be much more, uh, you, know, it, you know, establish collaborative and iterative relationships with firms. Uh, they are not based on subsidies or tax incentives, but in fact, they are customized assistance um, that, that deal with specific problems or constraints that firms uh, face. Uh, they would have at least soft conditionality on job creation. Um, and I said as earlier, they would be focused actually on smaller and mid-sized, uh, mostly services firms, rather than export champions, the most productive segments of the, of the, of the economy. And the essential quid pro, pro quo here uh, would be uh, to provide firms um, with some of the key inputs that they need in terms of access to stable and skilled workforce, uh, create conditions for reliable uh, production networks, horizontally and vertical, uh, provide the right kinds of technology, contractual and property rights uh, um, uh, conditions. Um, but in return, firms would be asked to uh, internalize uh, the good job externalities in terms of employment training and also investment and technological choices to, to adopt technologies that might be more appropriate. Okay, so this is entirely a kind of a new domain of thinking about uh, um, industrial policy in an essentially non-industrial area. Uh, but I think these are the kinds of issues that we will need to, to do a, a, a lot more uh, thinking on. This is a much more kind of a, a structuralist approach um, that directly um, sort of uh, targets the productive sector. Uh, sometimes I call it a kind of a productivist approach. Um, um, I think it, it, it moves us away from sort of traditional conceptions of markets versus, versus the state. Regulation begins to take a very different kind of, of uh, shape. Um, as I've already said, I think it entails, and I think this is quite a, an important advantage, it, it entails the merging, uh, the joining of our sort of equality and inclusion agenda with the economic growth agenda, uh, because essentially growth becomes only possible to the extent that we can make this middle segment of smaller or medium-sized firms more productive, um, and, and that's good book. That's not only good, it's really the only way you can get sustainable growth now in these economies, uh, but it's also good for inclusion and equity. Um, and I think the, the, the nature of regulation and this model of, of industrial or development policy, because it's collaborative, because it's iterative, because it's not based on ex ante rules, because it's, it's based on revision on an ongoing basis of uh, processes, uh, is is uh, it it's 
opens up paths to various types of institutional reform uh, without necessarily presuming that we need to make a big bang, uh, you know, conceive of, of radical institutional reform from the outset in a direction that we actually don't exactly know that it should take. Okay, um, so let me just end by mentioning, I, I think, a couple of, of pieces. Some of them are older um, on premature deindustrialization and on condition convergence in manufacturing. A couple of pieces that are um, co authored that I, I mentioned before on sort of the um, African firms with um, Jin Shen Zhao and Mia Ellis and Maggie McMillan, and uh, a firm, uh, a paper with Stephanie Stancheva that's actually focused on the rich country version of this. And these are all on my website. And um, I will stop right here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Danny. Oh, I already see quite a few questions in the, in the chat. I was just wondering, would you prefer to take questions one by one? Uh, we have about 40 minutes left, or should I should I read out about two questions at one in one shot? Two or three questions? Um, what would you prefer? I, I, will, I will handle, I will let you filter those questions and ask. I'm trying to get rid of uh, my screen here. Stop sharing. Okay. Sure. Okay, let me start then by asking. Why don't I? I'll, 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 I, since I can't, you know, I think it'll be better if you read, you know, you read or summarize or, or combine questions and I can handle them as you see the fit. Sure. Let me ask you actually a very interesting question that uh, Tom Vandeboe asked, which is that what we actually do see is uh, formal manufacturing employment rising quite fast in low income countries. So, for example, Ethiopia. But what we also see that if they are starting from a very low base. And the rapid growth of labor force means that the share, their share of employment isn't increasing very much. So with labor force growing at around 3% a year in many low-income countries, that probably explains why the share of manufacturing employment isn't increasing very much. So what, what would, in that case, what, how would one see the creation of good jobs in the coming two decades, especially for low, low and uh, middle-income uh, countries in Africa? If you assume that labor force growth is going to carry on in the way the rate is already doing. Sorry, and, no, uh, I, I, I'm afraid you'll have to start over. Sure. So the question is that what one is seeing is as we're seeing increase in manufacturing employment growth in many of the low income countries, starting on lower pace, we also see an increase in labor force growth. The share of manufacturing employment in labor in, in employment to some extent can be explained by the fact that labor force growth has been quite rapid in many low income countries, especially in Africa. So in that, in, that, in that case, how would one see the good jobs creation issue, especially in Africa? Let me actually also take, perhaps also take on to ask your second question linked to this kind of question, which is about services. Uh, and the question about how exactly, given that we have a lot of low priority jobs and services, how can services play the role of traditionally manufacturing, the role that manufacturing played earlier on? And so there's a question about manufacturing, especially on the fact that we seem to see manufacturing employment increasing, but not, but not the share of manufacturing employment. The second question is about service and the role of services in the, mod, in the developed part of that you are outlining. Do you want to respond to these questions? Yeah, I mean, on the first question, I mean, yes, I think that's sort of mechanically correct. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the, you know, the, there's no reason why the rapid increase in labor force should not have produced an even more rapid increase in uh, employment in manufacturing if the background conditions were such that this was feasible and, and profitable. In fact, the more rapid increase in labor force should have been a, a reason for you know, these countries to have a stronger comparative advantage and increasingly stronger comparative advantage in manufacturing. So, you know, traditional trade theory, in fact, would have suggested that those countries would have um, experienced very rapid uh, um, increase in the share of uh, manufacturing employment in the total labor force. So, um, so, so the fact that, um, you know, manuf manufacturing employment um, is not rising so rapid. The share of manufacturing employment is not rising very rapidly. I don't think can be explained by the very rapid labor force growth because it, you know we would have assumed that the causality would have gone in the opposite direction and would have reinforced rapid industrialization. Um, 
but but on, but in addition, I would say that the problem that I'm identifying is true is exists even in countries that have actually experienced a rapid increase, relatively rapid increase in manufacturing employment shares. Uh, and Ethiopia is such a case that that you know if you look at the aggregate, if you look at the share of employment in manufacturing in Ethiopia over the last 20 years, it's actually has increased uh, relatively rapidly. Um, as I said, I think somewhere from below 5% to nearly 10% over a relatively short period of time in historical time. But the problem is, is about the composition of that manufacturing employment and the kind of productivity paths that it presents, which is that it's, uh, you know, the, the formal share of it, it remains very, very low. And the, the bulk of the expansion has come in low productivity uh, uh, informal employment. Now, with respect to, you know, the you know, services playing the role of manufacturing, as I said, you know, services will have to take the role, the leading role that, that manufacturing will not play as much. But I do think it has the implication also for reasons that, uh, that I try to explain that you cannot create, you cannot get, you know, East Asian style, East Asian levels of growth rates uh, out of uh, increased services employment. And that's simply because most services are not tradable. And so therefore you need economy wide increases uh, in productivity that's much harder to achieve than simply, you know, moving sequentially as in the East Asian model of, you know, first having, you know, producing, uh, you know, um, you know, wigs, then producing, uh, you know, clothes and then producing, you know, car seats, then producing autos, uh, you know, and, and because you can't do that sequentially, then the institutional requirements of each, achieving economy wide productivity are that much harder uh, in, in services. So that I think puts a lead, puts a lid, puts a ceiling on how rapid growth you can achieve because you cannot rely on the world economy and specialism to the same extent as you did before. So on the one hand, I think we have no choice. And maybe the silver lining there is that in fact, that's a model of more inclusive growth from the, from the get go. Uh, uh, but, you know, on the one hand, you don't have that much choice on the, you know, on the other, you know, that even in the best circumstances, we're not going to see the kinds of East Asian growth, or even for most African countries, the pre pandemic uh, kind of growth rates. Right. So I think answers one question came from Dino Moretti that there is a upper limit to how much you can have growth in the service sector because of this problem that there isn't a world market, except maybe some tradable services like IT. So that's upper limit and that constrains you to some extent. But as you said, could lead to more inclusive growth possibly. I have a question from Maggie McMillan, um, who asked the question that what does it mean for traditional industrial policy like industrial parks or explosive zones? So in this kind, in the, in the approach you're you uh, you advocating, those sorts of old industrial policies may not be relevant anymore. Yeah, I think the industrial park model of you know uh, development is very much linked to the you know East Asian style you know export led industrialization model. So the idea there is just want to you know essentially isolate uh, a, a, a small segment of the economy from all the burdens, uh, institutional, regulatory tax, or otherwise that the rest of the economy faces. And that this can still, you know, even though you start off with a relatively few, you know, exporters who are able to take advantage of this, that can still be a successful model because their ability to expand and absorb employment uh, is, uh, is, is still very high. Now, I don't think those conditions hold anymore. And I think, you know, if you're even, I mean, the rage these, you know, at least pre pandemic was all about, you know, plugging into global value chains. Um, but the fact is that, you know, even when you're successfully plugging into global value chains and your industrial parks are, you know, your mechanism for doing that, uh, you know, they're not these, you know, these firms are not creating, um, you know, large amounts of employment of the type that you need. Uh, they're very poorly connected to the rest of the economy. Um, now, as you know, Maggie knows, and I think, you know, she's, she is also the one that, you know, always talks about this. I mean, there are ways of increasing the connections with local input suppliers, whether other manufacturing firms or services firms. Of firms that are, you know, you know, exporting and perhaps producing for global value chains. But the whole GVC idea is that they're in connect. There's only a little segment uh, 
that you occupy and then you leave all the inputs and you know the, the, all the sort of other parts of the production chain to other companies elsewhere so they you know become a very very tiny and not particularly you know employment producing part so i'm i'm yeah i'm, I'm sort of skeptical that this you know export zones or industrial parks are going to you know make a big change thanks danny actually gary fields had a question and gary probably could ask a question live because i think you are allowed to unmute yourself if you wanted to Yeah, hi, Danny. Uh, you had a you had you made a statement, um, and now I'm remembering uh, you internalize good jobs externalities. I think is what you said, and I wanted to ask you to elaborate on that point. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I'm referring here to uh, literature that's, you know, largely, you know, I think a, a, an advanced country literature, but I think applies, you know, equally well, um, perhaps more strongly to developing countries, which is that, that, um, that, you know, communities that are able or that lag behind that are not producing enough uh, good jobs end up suffering from a variety of, um, uh, you know, social and health problems uh, that become ultimately political problems. You know, we can link even the rise of far right populists in the um, in in uh, Europe and in the United States to, in fact, many parts of the economy, many regions which have lagged behind it, lost jobs because of the industrialization or the China trade shock, um, and and these become communities where. You know, you know, divorce rates shoot up. You know, single, you know, uh, 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 single parenthood increases, crime rates increase. Uh, you know, opioid abuse and mortality increase. Uh, so there are you know, broad social and political and health externalities from sort of inability of creating good jobs. I think the economic um, uh, uh, version of that story. Uh, is that, uh, you know, there are sort of, you know, thick labor market externalities from creating good jobs, which is that if you, you know, provide, you know, you create jobs with training and you, you know, you know, in low income environments where people get into the habit of, of um, you know, sort of, you know, being good workers, reliable workers, they have the social skills and the soft skills that, that are required to, to prosper in a modern economy. Then they become a resource because of labor turnover to uh, for for other firms as well, um, and and so I think you know economically there are sort of those externalities from sort of investing in these um, uh, uh, not just sort of um, uh, you know high productivity job because of, of of good equipment but also investment in skills and work habits and so forth that provide uh, can provide benefits to to other firms. Thank you. Um, Danny, I think this is what the last question that I think uh, I would ask, uh, I would uh, wanted to answer. But the question is then, I think it's a very important question actually, and something that I also wanted to ask you that how demanding is this alternative policy approach that you are advocating as compared to the traditional top down policy approach on state capacity? In other words, is it realistic that countries, especially in Africa and perhaps South Asia, can follow this kind of approach, which seems to be more demanding on state capacity, which, as you know, is quite weak in both these regions. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, uh, you know, I think, yeah, I have maybe two, two answers to that question. I mean, one would be that I would actually um, not, I, I, would, I would challenge the view that um, uh, the kind of approach to policy that are advocated is necessarily more demanding on state capacity. I'll come back to that question in a, in a, uh, because it turns out that the demands are somewhat different rather than simply qualitatively uh, um, uh, higher. Uh, because the, the traditional model of regulation, you know, even if you're not doing any industrial policy whatsoever, uh, the traditional model of ex ar you know ex ante arms length regulation is that you were able to sort of you know have this these perfect rules that you you articulate um, you know without interaction with you know uh, with by um, uh, with firms and then you know you then you're able to implement them perfectly um, and that you know that capacity issues don't arise there. But in fact, when you think about what that means, think about the omniscience that's required on the part of the you know state agencies to articulate those ex ante rules 
that they can then then the implementation capacity that's going to require by them to actually implement them. Um, and so it is it is just not true that our traditional model of regulation or, or sort of, you know, it does not require a tremendous amount of capacity. Uh, so it's true that I mean, what I'm advocating requires a different kind of capacity. And that's where I move to the second part of the answer, which is to say that state capacity is endogenous. I think it's built up. You can't, I think, when you're thinking about development policy, you can't simply assume there's a fixed state capacity and then simply optimize against it. You have to think about what you're trying to achieve, what is required, and having a good idea of what you're trying to do is the way that you build uh, state capacity. In fact, the kind of approach that I'm advocating is one that that is built on the idea that you start with very limited state capacity because you start with very limited goals. You don't you start with very limited trust on the part of the, the private and that these are built over time as the relationship advances, as knowledge advances, and you're able to learn more and you build up the capacity to monitor. So in a way, there's also a, a way of thinking about this, which is that it's it's a way of building state capacity in a particular direction without assuming that you, you have to have it before you start. Thank you, Daniel. I'm going to end here by saying that what you are saying is very important for all of us in this conference and others who work on these issues in labor economics and gender economics, that the traditional approach that we used to think about, you know, agriculture, manufacturing services, that approach may not be possible any longer, certainly in low income Africa and also perhaps also South Asia, uh, as versus what we see on East Asia. And I think it's very important for us about thinking about alternate development models and also thinking, as you mentioned, how to join up social policy and, and social transformation policies or growth policies together, which you often don't do in economics. So I think it's very important things to think about. And I'm so glad that you brought these issues up for, for us in this conference. So thank you so much for your time and for also a, a very reflective set of answers to, to the excellent questions you received from the audience. And thanks to the audience too for really great questions. We're going to end here now, and we're going to take a 43 minute break, come back at 4.45 Central European time for the next session, Migration and, Feed, migration and Skills. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Danny. Thank you, Kunal.